So, uh, and, and as I said, we mentioned, I know we covered the, uh, the, the human-powered helicopter story. We, we covered some of those things. I can't imagine the excitement, though, of, of riding one of those bicycles going that fast down. I'm nervous driving uh, at, at a speed, but a speed like that is incredible. Getting one of those bicycles pretty cramped in there, and we saw the GoPro pictures inside there. But just that rush of adrenaline, that breakneck speed, that uh, fear of what might happen if you lose your balance and crash. Now, the excitement must be heart-pounding. I wonder what the long-term effects of working on a team like that might be. You, you talked about you can rebuild everything except perhaps the pilot, but perhaps our next speaker can talk about how that might be possible, rebuilding the pilot or uh, re-engineering the heart. See the transition I'm working? This is the TV specialty we have. Um, She's going to be speaking, our next speaker, about uh, future developments in engineering new medical therapies. Uh, Dr. Malika, Melissa Melitia Betzik is a uh, professor at the University of Toronto and Canada Research Chair in Functional Cardiovascular Tissue Engineering. She obtained her BN from McMaster back in 99 and a PhD from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology in 2004, Chemical Engineering, and she's received numerous awards and fellowships, including Engineers Canada Young Engineer Achievement Award in 2012. The Queen Elizabeth II Diamond Jubilee Medal in 2013, uh, the NSERC EWR Stacey Fellowship in 2014, and in 2014 she was elected to the Royal Society of Canada College of New Scholars, Artists and Scientists. Now the long-term objective of her research is to enable heart regeneration through tissue engineering and development of new biomaterials. That is incredible in scope. She's an associate editor at ACS Biomaterials Science and Engineering, member of the editorial board of Tissue Engineering. Her research findings were presented in over uh, 100 research paper reviews and book chapters. I had to look this up, what an H index is. She has an H index of 40 and over 5,500 citations. She's also a co-founder of a startup company, Terra Biosystems, focused on the use of engineered tissues in drug development. So let's welcome you to the stage now. The idea of uh, organ regeneration is certainly something that we will achieve in the future, but uh, it's the idea that has been present for a very long time, uh, even since the ancient Greeks. So what you can see here is uh, Prometheus, and he was punished by the gods for taking fire from Mount Olympus and giving it to the humans. And his punishment was such that he was chained to a rock and an eagle would fly every day, chew on his liver, and then during the night the liver would fully regenerate, so the next day eagle can do the same. So back then that was just an idea, but in the 80s uh, this new area uh, that we now call tissue engineering emerged, and official birth date is uh, 1987. Uh, tissue engineering is defined by some as the perfect marriage of cell biology and chemical engineering. So the main idea there is that one could take cells from a human body, expand them in the lab in a sterile way, see them in biomaterials that are designed to support their viability, and then cultivate them for a period of time until they become fu fully functional, and then put them back in the body. Uh, more recently, about uh, 10 years ago, uh, the alternative uh, emerged. The fact that there are very many organs that are not suitable for transplantation. We can take those organs and put it in somebody because A, they will cause immune reaction, and B, in many cases, the cells are totally dead. So there is this idea that we could decellularize the organs, but still use their shape and extracellular matrix to support the growth of living cells, and uh, that's how we would pr produce organs for uh, humans who need them to repair them. And as a proof of concept that you can do something like this, I'll just show this slide, so don't get scared when you see all four pictures. So what you see here is a polymer material. It's a biomaterial, uh, the same one that the sutures are made of. It is shaped as a human ear. And then on this human ear, uh, the scientists took chondrocytes, which are cartilage cells, and they put it on the ear and then they implanted this human ear in a rabbit or on the back of a mouse. So the idea is not to take this ear now from the back of the mouse and to put it in the human. It's just a proof of concept that you can start from biomaterials and cells and create something that has the shape and look of a human organ. So there are some success stories. So there are some uh, tissues out there that are already approved and that are used by humans. They have saved many lives, especially in the areas of living skin substitutes. 
So this is the first living tissue that was approved for use. So nowadays you can get living skin substitutes called dermagraft, which is just a layer of fibroblasts or a two layer skin that contains fibroblasts and epithelial cells. And these are used for burn victims and for people who have diabetic ulcers or otherwise uh, wounds that cannot heal. So the economics of tissue engineering is actually quite different from the benefit that people who get these organs receive. This company that uh, um, developed this first ever approved living human tissue product actually went bankrupt. By the time they passed uh, this tissue through the clinical trials, they were completely bankrupt. And then people who acquired their patents and their products, uh, subsequent companies are actually making money out of their product. Uh, another example is Carticel. Uh, Carticel was developed by Genzyme Biosurgery, and it is for people who have arthritis. So it is possible to take chondrocytes from a person's knee, expand those chondrocytes in the lab, and then uh, put the cells back into the knee and cover it with the periosteal flap to relieve the pain that a person who has arthritis uh, usually experiences. And this is also an approved procedure in the United States. Uh, there are also emerging areas, and many of you have probably heard about bladder. Um, there is a, a professor, Atala, he made uh, artificial bladders using smooth muscle cells and uh, basically epithelial cells, and in this biomaterial that is shaped like a human bladder. And he repaired bladder in about half a dozen children uh, using this approach. And you can see uh, examples from surgery there. So he also formed a company called Tangion, that was supposed to commercialize this for the use of adult humans. And they recruited people from clinic, for clinical trials. However, they were not successful. Um, because in all of the cases in people who they recruited for clinical trials, and these were all adult patients who usually had cancer, so the bladder had to be removed. Um, essentially, they had adverse effects in majority of patients. And um, when I think about this, the reason something like this can happen is that a product that was de developed for uh, children, and children have a lot higher regenerative capacity than adults. However, when they built the company, they were thinking, where is the bigger market? And clearly the market was much bigger for the adult patients. And this is just an example of inappropriate use of a product developed for children in the uh, area of uh, uh, adult uh, bladder replacement. Uh, however, there is one uh, good example uh, from uh, the area of engineered blood vessels. And uh, perhaps you know somebody who has to undergo dialysis, kidney dialysis. And these patients, after a period of time, there are no more blood vessels in their arms left where you can poke. And because they have to undergo this treatment very often. And so some of them receive a biomaterial is placed under their skin as an AV shunt loop. And then the needles go into the biomaterial. But not everybody can tolerate this biomaterial. And in many of these patients, uh, the uh, vessel will clog and there will be no blood flow through the vessel. So there is a company right now, which is called uh, Humocyte, that is developing artificial blood vessels. They are currently in clinical trials for particularly this application. And the idea there is to build a blood vessel, have it available off the shelf, decellularize this uh, and tissue engineered blood vessel and then put it back in the patient so that it can be recellularized by the patient's own cells. And, and I, I'm also really proud to say that this uh, tissue engineered blood vessel is the very first example was developed in Canada at Laval University. In, uh, yeah, so that's, we should be very proud of that. And um, so what they did was actually quite tedious. Uh, they start with the monolayer of cells. And monolayer is, uh, the thickness is less than human hair. You can't see it with your own eye. So what they did is they just took many, many monolayers and they wrapped them around the mandrel until they got something that looks and feels like a blood vessel. And you can see this blood vessel here. This uh, process takes about 15 weeks to complete. And uh, the person who developed uh, this technology, he went to the United States because that's where the money was to uh, basically fund his invention. And so there is also another company right now um, which is called Cytograft, and they use this Canadian invention to create blood vessels 
also for dialysis patients. And you can see one example of an AV shunt loop that they developed right there. And based on their cl current clinical trials, this is very promising. People tolerate the blood vessels very well, and they uh, basically adverse effects almost never happen. Uh, another very uh, big area of need are congenital malformations. So about one in 1,000 babies will be born with some kind of defect in the heart. And so these defects include like a hole between two ventricles. That's called a ventricular septal defect. And some of them are born without uh, left ventricle. Or a left ventricle is so small that it actually doesn't pump. So a left ventricle is responsible for pumping blood throughout our bodies. So these children have to go massive, undergo massive surgeries, usually very many during their uh, childhood. And so what uh, doctors use nowadays, what the surgeons use are biomaterials. And these biomaterials, they cannot grow with the child. So essentially as the child grows, you have to do another surgery, another surgery, and so on. And so there is a very active area of research to create living tissue grafts that will be used to basically patch these holes in the heart or to create conduits that are needed uh, when a patient is undergoing this Fontaine procedure, where essentially right ventricle is then uh, used to uh, pump blood throughout the body. So there was this surgeon in Japan, his name was uh, Shinoka, and uh, in the 90s he uh, developed these vascular crafts that were based on biomaterials, and they were either just patches or conduits that looked like that. And uh, he would take bone marrow cells from the patients themselves. Or, in some cases, he would take uh, cells from the blood vessels of the patients, and these cells include smooth muscle cells and endothelial cells. And he would see them on these conduits or patches. He operated on 42 children, 23 conduits, and 19 patches, and he used them of these living tissue substitutes to basically uh, fix the holes in the heart. Uh, the biomaterial is designed in such a way that it will eventually go away. So it will biodegrade, so you're left re really with the living tissue that is made out of patients' own cells. So he was completely successful. None of these patients died or had any adverse effects. So many years later then, of course, he was recruited to come to the United States, first to Yale University, and uh, try to conduct uh, clinical trials in the United States. So about uh, six years and 3,000 pages later, uh, submitted to the FDA, and that's after he operated on 42 patients in Japan, they were given permission to conduct cl clinical trials in the US. And I just wanna uh, uh, also tell you one thing. In Japan at that time, you didn't need regulatory approval to conduct these surgeries. All that he needed was an approval from the local ethics board at the Tokyo Women's Medical University. So it, essentially the hospital reviewed his protocol and gave him approval to conduct the surgeries. In the United States and Canada as well, this is not possible. You need to get regulatory approval from Health Canada or from the FDA. So the team there at Yale had to submit about 3,000 pages to the FDA explaining how this therapy works to conduct numerous experiments in uh, mice, rats, and dogs to convince the FDA that this sur uh, surgery is indeed safe. So they were allowed to implant one child. It was a, a girl. Everything went well with her. Six months later, another child. So these are ongoing trials. And so far, there is uh, success, no adverse effects and uh, none of these children died. And mind you, they're really, really sick children in many cases. So these are all like uh, good examples and examples of promise of tissue engineering. However, I decided to put this uh, sign here that says, warning, proceed with caution. Because very often we hear in the news this question, well, why is the FDA so slow? Or why is uh, Health Canada so slow? When, when, when are these therapies going to be approved? Uh, when am I going to be able to get a uh, fully human beating heart to replace my ailing heart? And in my view, it is best to proceed with caution, to move slowly, and to make sure that we understand every single aspect of this therapy and all possible adverse effects because, before we move forward. Because just recently, um, there was one really uh, high-profile case that was quite damaging, I would say, to the entire field. 
It all started in 2008 when uh, surgeons in Spain created a uh, tissue engineer living trachea for a woman who had uh, tuberculosis and her trachea was destroyed. So they made a new one for her. They spent uh, many weeks, about eight weeks, starting from her own cells and from the biomaterial to create a trachea. This trachea saved her life and uh, you know, she was able to move around and get out of the bed. So everything was good with her. And then there was another patient and then another patient. And then a lot more patients for a product that was perhaps not very well checked. So the surgeon who did these studies, then he was recruited to Karolinska Institute. And then six out of eight patients who he operated on at Karolinska have died. So they're very, very sick patients. So maybe they have died regardless. However, you start getting these really bad headlines that are quite damaging to the entire field. And you can see an example, Karolinska vice chancellor resigns following criticism of this surgeon's work who did all the work at Karolinska. And then something like this in Vanity Fair, the celebrity surgeon who used Love, Money, and Pope to scan an NBC news producer. So essentially we have to proceed with caution with all new therapies. And uh, this brings me to uh, my area of research, which is uh, cardiac tissue engineering. All of the examples that I gave you so far were not related to replacing the beating heart, uh, heart tissue. So one uh, important cell type in the beating heart is cardiomyocyte. These cells cannot regenerate. So when you lose cardiomyocytes, they are shown here in red, they're replaced by scar tissue. And scar tissue is shown in blue. So scar tissue cannot beat. And with time, um, one will lose contractile function of the heart, and that's where heart failure occurs. And this will be accompanied by the changes in the shape of the heart. The ventricle, left ventricle will become much bigger, and the ventricular wall will thin. So there is this idea that by uh, injecting back these contra contractile cells of the heart, or using cardiac patches, which are pieces of heart tissue made in the lab, we will be able to restore the beating function of the heart. And so one example that I will show you here, oh, sorry, let's go back. Um, maybe I need a little bit of help to run the video. So an example that you see here is a creation of an engineered heart tissue that beats in a lab using mechanical stimulation. So what the scientists did is they took beating heart cells, they put them in a matrix like uh, collagen, and then they worked them out. Uh, this is like a little gym for the cells. They're stretching them. And then at the end of this process, you get a piece of heart tissue that is fully contractile and it beats. So you can see this ring that is fully contractile. So when they took many of these rings, and uh, they make like a flower-like structure. They put them on top of a red heart that was infarcted. They were able to completely restore the function, uh, the beating function of the red hearts. Uh, we developed the electrical stimulation as a method to create beating heart tissues. And uh, you will see two movies here. One of them is heart tissue made out of cells and biomaterials grown without electrical stimulation. It's barely able to contract. And the tissues that are paced with the electrical pulses, they beat quite nicely. Initially, we used cells from red hearts, but then we moved to the cells from stem cells, from induced pluripotent stem cells. And now we can make really nicely beating cardiac patches that uh, have fully human cardiomyocytes in there. Another idea in this field is that you could take hearts that are not suitable for transplantation. And an example that you see here are red hearts uh, that are decellarized. So the cells are removed by using a detergent. And then you can put back the cells, let's say human cells or cells from another donor, and you get this beating heart again from a structure that was initially decellarized. So there is this idea that you could do that with human hearts. Take hearts that are not suitable for transplantation, remove the cells, and then reseed them with healthy cells derived from stem cells. So what's a good source of human cardiomyocytes? Uh, we are not able to sample cells from any of your hearts or my hearts. Even if you were willing to undergo this surgery, 
and uh, let us snap a piece of your heart tissue, even if you are willing to do that. Most people are not willing to do that. Um, we would not be able to make more cells because they can proliferate. And you just can't make more of them. When I was a graduate student, there was this dogma that you are born with a certain number of heart cells, beating heart cells, cardiomyocytes, and you die with the exactly same number. So where are the cells going to come from? So now we know, and I just put this slide here because I think it's an interesting piece of information. Essentially, due to the nuclear tests, when people tested nuclear bombs above ground in the 50s, there was this spike of carbon-14 in the atmosphere. So if you were born in the 50s, your heart has more carbon-14 than people who were born before you or people who are born nowadays. And using carbon dating uh, from the samples of heart tissue of patients who had to undergo surgery, so nobody volunteered for this study, um, the scientists determined that cardiomyocytes can proliferate, but at such a slow rate that it's essentially useless. If you live to the age of 80, only about uh, one half of your heart cells will have proliferated. So this is not enough to fix anybody's heart. So in 2006, there was a huge discovery uh, by Shinya Yamanaka. He got Nobel Prize uh, in 2012. So he was the first person in the world who discovered how to make uh, pluripotent stem cells from something as simple as skin cell biopsy. So there was a conference in Toronto in 2006, and he uh, announced his discovery publicly for the first time here in Toronto. And this is something that is really transformative. This is like the, probably one of the biggest discoveries uh, of, of uh, this century. So you cannot take, we can take skin cells from any of us or from uh, blood cells, reprogram them with specific reprogramming factors. Only four factors are needed. And then you get pluripotent stem cells. So these pluripotent stem cells are similar to the cells in developing embryo. They can make any cell in your body. And now we know, uh, using uh, the directed differentiation protocols, how to make various tissues from these stem cells. And so what my lab does, we make uh, cardiac cells, cardiomyocyte cells, from these induced pluripotent stem cells that were actually skin cells before. And one common source is a neonatal foreskin uh, from the babies who are born in Mount Sinai Hospital. And so why is this important that you can make cardiomyocytes now, human cardiomyocytes, starting from skin cells? First of all, uh, it obviates ethical concerns. Now, if you have informed consent, you can get pluripotent stem cells pretty much from anybody. But it also helps solve another big problem. So what you see here are different drugs. And these are different drugs for different indications. There is one common thing to all of these drugs. They are by different manufacturers. One common thing is that they have all been withdrawn from the market due to cardiac side effects. So these drugs passed through animal studies, through clinical trials. They went into the use in population like us, like me and you, people use these drugs. And one notable example of a big failure is Vioxx. Viox killed 27,000 people in North America alone. And, uh, and it actually was a painkiller for people who have arthritis. And it was like a non-steroid painkiller. So Merck set up a $5 billion fund to uh, essentially compensate people who lost loved ones or who were damaged due to this drug. But I'm willing to argue that if you are one of the affected families, uh, there is no money that can replace your loss. And so you may be wondering, how is this possible, you know? How come that pharmaceutical industry let something like this slide through? <coughs> but because they, they're using animal models and they're using cells that come from animals, they never test uh, drugs on human cells until they come into humans. So they're only about 75 to 90% sure that a drug is safe before it is given to a human for the first time. So the big question for the whole uh, field now is, can tissue engineering help us discover better and safer drugs? And using iPS, stem cell-derived heart cells, can we personalize drug therapies for individual patients? So can we now take your skin cells, 
make your heart tissue and personalize your drug therapy for you so that the side effects don't happen. And so this is something that my lab is actively working on. So we think we have a, a solution to this problem. And so we are able now to make these small uh, strings of human heart tissue in the lab that we uh, call biowire. And one of our tricks is the use of this electrical stimulation. So we keep ramping up frequency of electrical stimulation every day during the culture of these cells. And we mimic both geometry and elongation of these cells, just like they would experience in the native heart. And ramping up the frequency of stimulation is important because it's almost like interval training. It's not just gym, it's a very special gym for the cells. It makes them work harder and harder every day. And so at the end of this process, you get a piece of uh, human mature heart tissue. In our current uh, configuration, we have uh, two flexible wires in a plastic dish. Cardiac cells are hanging on these plastic wires. And as they beat, the wire deflects and we can measure force of contraction. And uh, so you can, you can see that in this movie. So online, this little heart tissue beats and by looking at the deflection of the wire, Hopefully I can replay this movie. By looking at the deflection of the wire, we can exactly tell you the force of the beating human heart tissue. And as we apply drugs, such as here, as we apply drugs, we can see how the force of contraction, how the force of beating changes. And this is one example drug, isoproteranol, right? We apply it to this mini heart tissue, human heart tissue in the lab, and we can see how the uh, force of beating goes up. So we believe that this can hel uh, help us um, catch side effects early before a drug goes into human use, and it can also help us de deliver more effective drugs. Uh, another example that I want to show here is uh, uh, this promise of personalized medicine. Uh, this is collaboration with Uli Bokel. He's a um, cardiologist uh, from Wisconsin at the Medical College of Wisconsin. So he treats a lot of pa patients with heart disease, with heart fa failure. And uh, there is not much that he can do for people who are undergoing heart failure. So what he did is he sampled the cells, skin cells from these patients, and he has a bank of 250 cell lines uh, from different patients. So he sent us um, cells from two patients. And he said, I'm gonna send you cells from two patients. One of them is very much affected and it has very severe heart failure. One of them is not affected. And he said, I won't tell you which one is which. You go run your experiment in BioWire and tell me which of these cells beat better. And so we did this experiment completely blindly and in this BioWire system, it really the blue one is less affected and the yellow one is more affected. And in our in vitro assay in the BioWire wells, definitely the cells, cardiomyocytes that came from a patient who was less affected developed more force compared to the patient who's more affected. So even without knowing where the cells came from, these biowires, biowire wells were able to correctly capture the phenotype of these cells. And not only that, we are able to correctly measure the force and correlate to individual patients, but also when we look at the structure of the cells, that they make in this tissue, definitely the one, uh, the patient who's more affected gave us tissues that were poorly organized. <laughs> the cells are not elongated compared to the patient that is less affected. And this is something that would come from like a normal person who's not affected. So nowadays for the first time really in history, we can mimic your disease in the dish. And then the next step for us is now to come up with drug treatments that are personalized for these two patients. And so there is clearly a limit to how much an academic lab can do. Uh, all of the work that I showed you so far is done by my PhD students, master's students, and postdocs. And um, they also have classes, they have to TA. So there are only 24 hours in a day. So the, you know, there are only as many things as we can do in one day. So we decided to uh, try to commercialize this work um, in collaboration with uh, uh, some commercial, new commercial entity. So we, uh, in 2014, we founded this uh, company which is called Tata Biosystems, and it is funded by a venture capital firm from New York. And the idea there is that Tata now offers this screening platform commercially and it collaborates with about 
six big pharma companies right now who are using our platform to test uh, their drugs. And so um, besides just focusing on uh, human heart tissue, I want to go a step further. So heart is essentially at the center of our research, but there are also other uh, organs. And in many cases, uh, drugs are withdrawn due to interactions. And uh, perhaps you will have a drug that will be processed by the liver, and then the product may be damaging to the heart. Or people who have cancer, they are treated with uh, chemotherapy. And in many cases, chemo will kill their cancer, but it will also destroy their heart. So you get this case where you, know, you're not, you don't die of cancer, but 10 years later, you die of heart attack. Um, so uh, our current projects in the lab are focused on this idea of building a person on a plate. So where you can have these mini uh, tissues on something that looks like a well plate, and then you can put together a liver and heart and perhaps neural tissue, and it's all vascularized. And then you can study how a drug will influence this in a more complex environment. And so you have one example of a tissue right here. And next Monday, a paper on uh, this platform is gonna come out in a very high impact journal called Nature Materials. So just uh, in some summary of my presentation and in future uh, challenges, uh, I mentioned some uh, tissue engineering su success stories, such as living skin substitutes and chondrocytes. These are currently available approved therapies. I also mentioned that the economics of bringing something like this to the market is non-trivial. Uh, right now, we have in clinical trials blood vessels and living patches for treatment of uh, children who have congenital malformations. <laughs> Uh, going, po going forward, uh, we definitely have to think about selection of cell source and regulatory pathway, working with the FDA and the Health Canada <coughs> to gain permission to test these in humans. But where engineering heart tissue is making a difference right now is in this area of uh, uh, drug discovery, where uh, heart tissues, engineers' heart, heart tissues, can uh, definitely help you discover safer and more effective drugs. So at the end, I would just like to thank everybody in my lab who essentially generated the results that I showed you. Our collaborators, we don't work in this isolation. It's a team effort by many labs in Toronto and also in the United States. These are our funding sources. All of our work is funded by grants from the federal government, such as NSERC and CIHR. Some of it comes from Ontario government and some of it from foundations, such as Heart and Stroke Foundation. So please support Heart and Stroke Foundation. Also, I'm on the board of directors of OSPI, so I would like you to invite you to join OSPI if you haven't already done that. Thank you very much.